Early 20s, I was diagnosed with a brain tumour. That was the first knockdown. Holly Tucker, ex-CEO and founder of Not On The High Street. Holly's story is mind-blowing. We go and pitch the idea of Not On The High Street to the land of VCs who would tell us that it was lovely that us women wanted to create a crafts website, but really there was nothing in it. And I just said, well, we're actually going to change the face of retailing. Funny enough, it's not a craft website. We tried to build a marketplace with no tech experience, but we knew what we wanted. And so we found someone who built the technology that eBay were building in America, and we just relaunched and, and we nailed it. How could I smile or laugh? I found myself becoming a different version of me. One of the lines at Holly Co is bringing color to gray. And I think I was turning gray. Holly Tucker, ex-CEO and founder of Not On The High Street, one of the UK's most loved brands, but a real pioneer in its space at its time. Holly's story is mind-blowing. How she rose from someone that had no experience, didn't have huge amounts of capital at a time when women in business, especially women in tech, had it harder than anybody else. She built an online tech company that went on to be worth hundreds and hundreds of millions. But her story isn't straightforward. It's riddled with pain, divorce, heartbreak, turmoil, and having to reinvent and refind herself time and time again. The fundamental life lessons that she shares today and that she unpacks for us are life lessons based on problems that we're all going to experience in our lives. It's a real joy to bring you this conversation. And I wanna thank Holly for her openness, her intellect, and her incredibly inspiring personality. Without further ado, I'm Stephen Bartlett and this is The Diary of a CEO. I hope nobody's listening, but if you are, then please keep this to yourself. Holly, I always start in the same place in this podcast because I think it provides the greatest amount of context on a person. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat sort of bored of asking these questions, but they're so incredibly foundational to who you went on to become because mm -hmm. everything from, you know, the start of your journey till now proves that you are clearly an outlier in every way. So tell me, below the age of 18, what were the factors that went into making that person that went on to become this person? Well, um, I was nicknamed Holly Hurricane. <laughs> and that was because I couldn't wait to get to the next stage. So when I, um, you know, turned, I think it was 12, I persuaded my dad that I needed to get a job in a pub cleaning it. So he would wait outside in the car park at five o'clock in the morning. I don't think I do this for my son, by the way, anymore, but he would wait outside the, um, the pub and would um, pick me up after my shift. I went on and then I just continually worked when my friends weren't working. I, um, decided that, you know, I needed the first mobile phone, you know, one of those bricks. I think it was one-to-one. -one. I think that it only worked in the M25. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I was just continually pushing it to be grown up or to be out of childhood, I think. And so... Why? Um, because I was, in, I think, and still am today, incredibly excited by life. I, I really wanted to juice life and I was ready to work. And I think work has always been um, an incredibly important thing. I remember at 15 um, becoming an intern for publicist advertising agency um, on Baker Street. So as my friends would spend the summer out in the, you know, getting up to mischief, no doubt, I would be traveling up to Baker Street to spend my summer working. And I did that when I was 15, 16 and 17. And it actually en ended up being on the day of my A-level results, my mum waited around the corner and I went for a job interview on the same day I was getting these A-level results in the morning. And I got a job as the junior, junior team maker at Publicist Advertising Agency. And that I now call my sort of uh, university of life. Um, and then my mum got me in the car and we went to pick up my A-level results where I thought up until about a year ago, I got a D in business studies. I actually got an E. Um, and um, 
that was just ironic because that was the moment I started work. I celebrated my 18th birthday in the office and I've been working ever since. I'm 44 now. And so I think that that says a lot about who I was. I was just so eager to be in the big wide world. Um, I remember my parents going on holiday and I was living at home. And I mean, again, if my son ever did this to me, I just um, rented a place with some friends in Halston because I was working um, in in Baker Street um, and just moved out. I just packed up the car and drove the car and (laughs) text my parents to say, mum, dad, I've moved out. Um, I'm living in Halston, which they weren't necessarily thrilled about. Mm. Um, At what age? I must have been 18, yeah, right. 18. Um, so it, it, that is ha- that has been me. I was dyslexic, didn't find out um, for my exams. I am definitely um, someone who has to work hard to achieve um, and I've always been creative. So that has been a constant in my life. Um, I studied art uh, at A-level and I created this huge sculpture that they had never had someone do before called Tom, Dick and Harry. And they actually cast it in bronze and had a crane pull it out of the art studio and they had to take the windows out. And it's still there today at my school um, because I I always go for it, I suppose. Um, so yeah, that was me, you know. But for, um, So when we say before the age of 18, you know, I was in an office at the age of 18. Um, all my friends went to uni. Um, and as I said, I did this university of life thing. Um, that work ethic, was it at all influenced by your parents? I know you say you're excited by life, but was there an example set by your parents about work ethic? Um, I think, you know, I was always fascinated by my father's role. He was um, a financial um, a CFO at General Electric and he travelled the world and I was always fascinated with what he did. Um, my grandparents all had, you know, their own businesses and I was fascinated by that. Um, my mother had a small business um, when I was younger. I think that always, you know, how we get our money was always placed. um, uh, We didn't have, you know, we weren't, we were fine, but money and where we got our money was always spoken about. So I I very quickly realised you work to live. So that's what happens. And so if I wanted to go out, I needed to work for that money. So that has just, that was always part of me. So, you know, maybe that just led to me just continuing to work because that meant that you lived. And mm. um, so, yeah, so I, I I think that, but my work ethic, you know, again, we were talking off air, you know, I give it my, my all, you know, I lose myself in my work. Um, it is me. And so that's an interesting thing as you get older. So you you work at Publicis until you're 20 years old? I, I Yes, I worked there until I was about 21 years old. And then I got headhunted to move to Condé Nast. Oh, yeah. uh, meantime, I managed to marry my childhood sweetheart. Again, uh, Hurricane Holly was in a hurry. Uh, so I bought a place. I got married. Um, I need some more context here. So your childhood sweetheart, you met him when he was... We were 14. 14. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, okay, you're both 14. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And we got married uh, at 21 and um, divorced by 24. And so it was an incredible, my early 20s were a very, very difficult period of time of my life because I had built up since I was 18, you know, I had built up this life and this world. And of course you get married then, right? And, you know, you're going to have children and you've got a property in Chiswick and, you know, you're all there. And then sort of life pays you back or gives you, I don't say pay you back, that's the wrong way, gives you an interesting lesson, which is be careful to be in a hurry all the time. Just because you want it and you can get it doesn't mean it's right. And so we found ourselves as natural human beings developing in our personalities and things and realising that we weren't destined to be together forever. Um, Meantime, I was diagnosed with a brain tumour and that was fine. It wasn't fatal, um, but it had a lot of side effects. So at quite a young age, at sort of 23, 24-ish, I was dealing with a lot, full-time job, um, all these sorts of things. And I, again, I look at my son who's about to turn 17, I think, wow, 
Holly, you were young to do all of this. So in my early 20s, a lot of things changed for me. Um, and I had to slow down. I had to lo- lose full-time work. I had to become freelance. I had to concentrate on my health. I had to get divorced. Um, and so, yeah, and that was the first knockdown. I would say I've had two of those in my life. Um, and that was the first one. And it was pretty painful. You, you find out at 23, 24 years old that you've got a brain tumour. How, you, how did you find that out? Oh, I was just very poorly. Um, I put on a lot of weight and um, I was uh, just not functioning correctly. And in the end, um, with all pushing it, because also, also a young girl going to the doctor and pushing it with all the scans we found out. But as I said, it was it was livable with and, um, you know, and that's something that's fine. Mm. Um but it caused just a huge amount of turmoil. And um, that's not to say I think my marriage would have ever lasted anyway, um, but it just created turmoil. And I now think back to how tough your early 20s are. You know, I don't think I would repeat them. Um, I think it's quite a difficult age. You're meant to be grown up, but you're just still a kid. You're trying to work everything out at the same time. Yeah, point, absolutely. Right? Well, especially you, the situation you'd put yourself yeah, in. Yeah, exactly, time, exactly. You know? Yeah, but yeah. you just think the world's against you. And now I just realise it was a it was a great kick up the butt. Mm. And so you go into freelance work, you're, you're separated from this partner. Mm-hmm. You've learned the lessons there, hopefully. Yeah. The, um, you've understood the situation with your health. Yeah. You didn't have to have an operation. I'm no, guessing. no, okay. couldn't have one, no. Yeah, I, I was, I asked that particular question because I actually found out last week that one of my one of my best friends has a brain tumor mm. and I and I was intrigued by the array of emotions that you felt in that moment and I asked that question from a supportive friend standpoint as, as how you support someone that's that's um found that out I think she's 24 24-ish mm-hmm. and she found out that she found out two weeks ago that she's having she had a brain tumor and they put her into an operation the the next Tuesday. Wow. Because okay. of the severity of the situation. Yeah. So she's just come out of the the operation last night. Oh, I really wish her well. I mean, mine mm. wasn't, you know, it wasn't that serious. Yeah. So, you know, that was something that um, I was very, very lucky about. But I think one of the things was, is that I had to find, you know, twice in my life, I've had to find out who I am again. Because when you pull your identity into something else that's not yourself or or it becomes your identity, I think we all do that in relationships sometimes, you know, that you are married or, you know, that's what I did as a young girl. So then when it all fell apart, who 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 am I? And that was a really difficult moment for me. And Slightly the thing that saved me was going back to my creative roots. You know, if I hadn't gone to the University of Life, I was going to go and do an art degree. So creativity sort of saved me. And I I went on to, you know, create vegetable wreaths, which again, I just always think, you know, the story needs to be sexier than the vegetable wreath. But there it was. And I, I built this wreath and I went down to my local high street to try and sell it. And I was just freelancing at that time in publishing. But this was allowing me to be creative in the evening. Why vegetable wreaths though? Um, of all the things. You know, it, it, it was just, I needed to be creative. I love, I love interiors. And I've always, you know, at mm. the age, my 14th birthday present was a subscription to the world of interiors. Mm. Um, so, you know, that has just been something I have to have a creative environment to exist in. So my home right now is a shrine to not on the high street. I had to move house to get bigger and bigger homes <laughs> just to hold what, you know, you can yeah. imagine um, what I'm surrounded by. And so um, that was just glorious for me. You know, why not? Um, I just did it. And then that was, this path that just opened up to me because I realized that I needed to sell these things because I was going to obviously become a millionaire, you know, mm. for reinventing the wreath because that's mm. what need was needed in the world. And I realized that actually there wasn't any local fair that I could go and sell it. So again, if you dream it up, you can make it happen. So I created the first Chiswick Christmas Fair with 200 stalls so that I could get the best stall. You say that like it's so, so simple because a lot of people, A, wouldn't have even they would have had the reef idea and never done anything about it. And then when they realised that they couldn't sell it anywhere, they would have never done anything about that as well. But there's clearly something that underpins that 
perspective that okay well that doesn't exist so I can create that and then yeah. well that doesn't exist so I'll create that to support that that's my DNA that's what I'm doing now at Holly and Co it's what I did at Norton High Street I don't look just because it doesn't exist doesn't even bother me it's actually just part of the fun of building I'm I'm I love building I love what about the risk Holly um well what risk because um you know, what was going to go wrong there? People weren't going to come to the fair. I knew that they would. I knew that they'd like my wreaths because they were good. I didn't see risk. You know, I, I I I just went into it and I created this event and it kicked off. It was amazing. Sold all my wreaths. Hated wreaths by the end of the thing. Was not going to have that career, but now I was going to have a fair career. I was going to put on events. So I quit my job um, and told my dad, who's my been my CFO at Not on the High Street and his CFO at, at, at Holly and Co. And just said, right, that's what I'm now going to do. And so I delivered all the wreaths, got rid of that out of my household. And I then um, created these events and put on 20 events around London with small businesses. And that was almost, you know, again, a pretty bad existence because I was on my own putting on these events. It was, you know, pouring with rain one day. You can't control the weather. You can't control the football being changed. You can't do anything. But what it did do is it made me realise um, my total love for small businesses and what they create because I curated all of those stalls Mm. And I could see that there was absolute hidden treasure that no one else had discovered before. Mm. And so the town hall roof, I suppose, was the prototype to not in the high street. I want to, I want to go back to something you said a, a second ago, which was about that moment where you kind of lose orientation, your marriage is ended. Cause I just think so mm -hmm. many people listening to this either have gone through that are going through that or are going to go through that moment where they have a significant life change which completely makes them unanchored from what their like purpose is and who they mm -hmm. are. And mm -hmm. um, I, I'm fascinated by how long that process lasted for you and what advice you'd give to someone who, because I experienced it a little bit when I like left my business or well, actually the first time I experienced it was when someone made me a really big offer for my business. And then I went home that day and like mentally spent the money mm -hmm. and thought, well then what, who am I? What, yeah. Well, who am I now? Like, yeah. Because yeah. your whole identity was attached yeah. to this business. Yeah. So who am I? So like, what advice would you have for someone um, that's going through that sort of like loss of direction because there's been a significant life change and they, they don't know, you know, who they are or which way to go anymore? Well, it's actually something that now I have a, a word for, um, whereas at the time it was a sort of process. When I consult with small businesses, um, and I, I don't now do one-on-ones, but um, in my book, for instance, it's called A Brand Heart. And it's basically, I believe that a business has a heart and everything has to come off it. You know, that's the pumping organ that everything should come back to. Now, you as a founder need to understand what should go into that heart and it actually should be made up of you. So I think what I did was I went back to, so what makes Holly exist? What makes Holly alive? And through that process, which was about a year, um, and my second one, which will come to probably, you know, lasted two or three years, was um, creativity was one. Um, discovering um, creative folk, um, my the, my community, who was I meant to belong to, um, building, entrepreneurism, um, it, all these elements were coming through. I was lucky um, in my luck at the end of the first this year, I actually met my partner um he's been my partner for 18 years and I got married in lockdown so now he's my husband um so I was lucky to find somebody um and he did a lot of cheerleading for me you know sort of because when you're in that place you don't really um you don't have a perspective on anything that you can give anymore and so I think that's another incredibly important thing is to surround yourself with people who adore you and are willing to tell you what makes you um what makes the sunshine out of you you know mm. what that is and so I was lucky to have that but that brand heart like the who is holly just cutting it up into five pieces and say okay if there were five things that I've got to concentrate on to bring 
to restore me, what are they? Um, but it's a pretty painful process. What role does patience play from in, in all of that process? Well, none at the beginning. <laughs> I mean, zero patience. Uh, Hurricane, Hurricane Holly. I mean, yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Now I've got a little bit more, you know, actually I'm enjoying that getting older and just having a slight um, listening more, um, not running so fast um, and picking up the cues along the way, which I think I probably missed the first time around. So I'm actually really happy to become more patient. I mean, we'll put it in perspective, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm uh, very ambitious. So, but I am actually learning to listen, um, to listen to the world a bit more. And even, even though you've cut your heart into five pieces there to dissect who you actually are, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you know the... <clears throat> the path as in, in terms no. of like the business idea that's going to get you get you there or the the career but you you know the fundamental principles of what you're looking yeah. for and then what you need to do like experiment do something yeah just well actually that's not what i did for not no. in the high street but it is what we've done for holly and co because um that was the you know, that's the point, isn't it? You learn, I, you know, from Not in the High Street and Holly & Co, I have learned I don't want to do it all again as I did with Not in the High Street. So I don't want a final destination. When you take VC money on, you have some final destinations that you you know, you've turned right and not left. Mm. So always your course of direction will be to the right. With Holly & Co, what I loved was not not having that and also being able to... Um, you know, when people said, so what is Holly & Co? I could barely explain it. I didn't have an elevator pitch. I didn't want to fall into that. Actually, I think that is the beauty of what I was looking to do, but I did have a brand heart. I knew that we had that. I didn't have the final destination, but I have the coordinates of a few places I know to go. And I know that I am, you know, I know the direction I'm heading. I always call it like an anchor. You know, I've got an anchor in the future. Mm. I've got the rope that I'm holding and that rope will change, mm. change. It will pull me to the right and left, but I am anchored. Got a North Star. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I'm enjoying that. That's what I'm really enjoying. So I've got to, we've got to go through this, um, this, uh, not on the high street story, because I, when I was reading um, about your journey up until this point and the experience you'd had, in, you know, working on, you know, creating a, a market or a fair for, for these small businesses. And then to go from there to trying to create a e-commerce site in the year that you did, I thought was just madness. And I think about entrepreneurs coming into the den. And um, one of the questions I always ask them is like, have you got tech experience? Yeah. Who's, who's got the technical sort of competence within the yeah. team? Show me what you yeah. know. Yeah. And from looking at what your journey up until that point, you didn't have any of that stuff. Yeah, no, none. How beautiful is naivety? Well, you yeah, know? delusion. Yeah, <laughs> it is awesome. You know, I look at it, you know, before when I was in it, in it, you know, I thought, oh my gosh, there's so many things that we needed to have done before. Now I look at it and I think, could I just bottle up that naivety and just take a swig of it every single day? You know, naivety is the thing. If we had known really that we were creating one of the first marketplaces in the world, you know, at that point in time, there was eBay and Amazon. Amazon was still selling books. eBay had, you know, your socks that you got for Christmas and the, you know, the title was one, two, three, grandma's socks. Um, uh, Etsy hadn't launched yet. Um, we were basically looking at, a, you know, like many businesses start, a human problem that we were experiencing and thought we could create a solution. And all we needed to do was take all those small businesses that were under my town hall roof and just put them on this thing called the internet. And then wouldn't it be great if you could shop from, you know, Lily Bell and shop from the letter room and put it into one basket. Well, of course. Okay. Well, we got 20 grand. So let's build a website for 20,000 pounds. And we found someone who could do that. Big watch out there. Question mark. Um, <laughs> and funny enough, three days before launch, uh, we realized that they couldn't do that. You know, that there was no checkout. But because again, there was no experience, we had already told the whole world with a microsite that was counting down the days to launch and all the press that we were very able to get um, that we were launching on this specific day, the 3rd of April. So this 20 grand, where did that come from? Well, the the startup um, that Sophie and I had, so I, I 
the story is that basically after your local fair, I had a three-month-old boy called Harry um, with my now husband, Frank. And um, I realised that I couldn't ignore what I had witnessed when you put a group of small businesses together that are like-minded and bring together discerning customers, there's something that happens there. The high street was dying and I needed to do that, but I knew I didn't want to do it alone. After your local fair, which was my fair business, I couldn't do it alone. So I just wrote to my old boss, Sophie, from Publicist. So she was my boss saying, you know, I basically don't think there's anyone else on the planet that has the yin to my yang, you know, is able to rewrite the English dictionary um, and can be that person. And so I wrote to her and I still got the email and it says, you know, I want to bring everything that's not on the high street together. But I had a terrible beta name. And uh, 24 hours later, she said yes, because she was that customer too. She wanted to find the curious, the discover the small businesses and things. But I had a three-month-old baby that wasn't going to stop me. And so we went on this journey to build it. And as I said, you know, we tried to build a marketplace with no tech experience or retail experience, but we knew what we wanted. And so we um, pulled together a few savings. Uh, We were both with young children. Our husbands were working um, to pay for the mortgage. Um, We got a loan from a bank, very small loan, and we remortgaged our homes slightly, both of us. So I think we came to it with about £80,000, thinking that we had contingency in there. I mean, everything. And funny enough, uh, we didn't have enough money. But we launched on the 3rd of April with no checkout to our shopping site. Um, Why was there no checkout? Well, because funny enough, eBay couldn't even build a a multi-partner checkout with one basket. You know, no one had yet actually done that technology. So, um, and I remember naively calling, you know, calling eBay, just picking up the phone (laughs) to eBay, thinking, I don't know who I'm going to get through to. Hey, hi, is that the CTO? (laughs) You know that stuff you're building there? Is there any chance uh, I could have it too? (laughs) Uh, because we're dealing with a company in Cornwall who uh, has let us down. Um, so we didn't, you know, this hadn't been built yet, this 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 functionality. And so uh, we launched, we called it a press preview and we just pivoted and we were uh, on something called Daily Candy, which was huge at the time. We were on the Daily Mail front cover, all this sort of stuff. It was great. So we got all the traffic, but no one could check out. Um, But, you know, as mother lions that we were, and I always liken businesses to being a parent, uh, something that in my latter years was frowned upon uh, by the VCs, Because actually, I do believe that when you have that spirit of a parent, you can lift a car Mm. off a child. When you're a founder and literally you're launching a shopping site with no checkout, what are you going to do? And so we found someone who in two weeks built the technology that eBay were building in America. Mm. um, And we just relaunched and and we nailed it. Did you run out of money in those early? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. We ran out of money. We launched in the April and we're running out of money in the July um, because, funny enough, technology costs a lot of money, especially when it's never been built before. And um, and so we had to go and raise money. And that was one heck of an experience because if you want to take yourself back to 2006, um, when we know 1% of VC money right now goes to women, what do you think the statistic was then? So we would pack up our personalised bags. We'd get on the tube, no money for taxis. We would knock on the doors with meetings, you know, that people knew someone who knew someone. And we'd go and pitch the idea of not in the high street to the land of VCs, who pretty much 100% would tell us that their wives did the shopping in their household and that it was lovely that us women wanted to create a crafts website, Mm. but really there was nothing in it. And I just said, well, we're actually going to change the face of retailing. Funny enough, it's not a craft website. And um, that continued right up until the Christmas. And we were now paying our staff on our egg credit card 
checkbooks. We were, my parents remortgaged their house twice. Uh, Sophie's parents uh, lent us money. I mean, it was dark, dark days. I mean, not in the high street, it was definitely on its last breath. But the issue was it was working. You know, it hadn't been working up until that point. We used to have a bell that you would ring when there was a checkout of 30 pounds and we were taking 10%. And this bell would ring every second day. And we were just thinking, my God, this is just hell. But just as we were really running out of money, the bell just kept on ringing. It was happening because it was Christmas and people wanted great gifts. Um, So that was an extraordinary journey, but one that ended well, because we found someone who understood what we were building. Um, And by the February 2007, we got our first round of investment. How long did that take to find that person? So from when you realised you had to start fundraising to the point when you, um, the money hit your bank, let's say. Well, it must have been... uh, eight months. Um, but when we were pitching, it was just before Christmas. And I remember just telling, I mean, we hadn't got our first set of accounts yet. You know, we were there. And I remember my father being in the pitch meeting and, um, you know, we were putting what we were doing there, obviously avoiding the conversation that we were paying the staff with our credit card checkbooks, you know, like everything is fine. Oh my gosh, you know, it's like every time you raise any money, the graphs only go, you know, through the sky and how you're going to do it, we'll work it out. Um, But it was an amazing uh, moment. And uh, Tom Teitman, who was the investor, had just written the first check for lastminute.com. And he saw what we were trying to do. And he actually saw the power of female female purchases and that whole world. And so... um, we did the pitch and he, he, you know, he played with us. He, he basically said, that's great. Thank you so much. And we packed up and we left. And my father said, I'm so proud of you both, knowing that not in the high street just died, that we hadn't got the money and it was finished because we, our homes were on the line. It was, it was finished. And just as we pressed the bell for the elevator, he said, actually, do you have a moment? And he bought a bottle of champagne and, and that was it. Our destinies changed, but that was how close we were. Um, But, you know, we definitely turned right, that meant. We got our first VC, fantastic. And then, um, you know, we started building Not On The High Street and it was growing very, very quickly. Was it ever going to fail in your view? I know you came close, but was it ever going to fail? Not at all, never. Isn't that funny? Never, never, never. You know, at the same time that we were running out of money, I was buying every single URL for the whole world. So we couldn't pay for the heating. Mm. So we had coats on between, you know, 9 a.m. and 2. That was the coldest period in our office. And then the because the whole building was being knocked down, but we just kept our office. So we had no boiler, no heating. Mm. But I was still buying the URLs across the globe. And and to this day, I think it's one of the most fantastic businesses. Um, but n- never would it fail, ever. Because, you know, you, as a parent, You know, if your child had any issue, would you not think that you could overcome those issues? Absolutely. And that's the resolute resolute that you need to be in business. It's why I call Not On High Street my first business baby, Holly & Co. my second. I love them as if they are my children um, and they will get my my full attention. What is your favourite flavour of Huel, Jack? Berry. Berry. My favourite flavour of Huel is banana. Berry used to be my favourite flavour. And I saw someone tweet the other day, they said, um, because Huel is now in Tesco's, but the only flavour in Tesco's is the chocolate flavour, they were sort of demanding Tesco's put the um, the berry flavour in because that's Steve's favourite. It's not. My favourite flavour is clearly banana now. Th- those are the ones I look for the most. What does Huel do for me? I mean, I've talked about this extensively, but for me, I get the, a nutritionally complete diet in 60 seconds. And in the world I live in, that is a that is a remarkable thing, and this is why even before they became a podcast sponsor, I was buying Huel to my office um, every single week. You know, and the funny thing is, Jack, who's the director and producer of this podcast, he tried Huel once. I was like, nah, yeah, yeah. The guy is addicted to Huel. He's a fiend for Huel now because once you see the impact it has, you understand the convenience, you understand it's nutritionally complete. For me, it's life changing, and that's why Huel is a bit of a it's a bit of a cult. Once you try it, you can't go back. 
You just said there that, you know, the company was completely out of money, but I, but I, I could tell that you also didn't believe it would fail, which is a bit of a yeah. contradiction to some degree. But Well, I, because it was just money. Yeah. And you could, you could figure that out. <laughs> I don't know how, yeah, but, but you know, it, you know, out. money is just this, you know, okay. So if we got the money and the hard bit really is doing the doing, isn't it? Yeah. It's building it. So I always just knew somehow this will work out. I mean, of course you have the old terrible dark days, but I knew it was going to work out. How could it not? We were on to something. And I knew that. That level of optimism in upon reflection of your career of the last you know couple of decades how important has that optimism been that just like unexplainable unjustifiable i don't know why but it'll just it will all work out yeah. optimism because you've also because you because you've employed a lot of people seeing the opposite that sense yeah. of like catastrophe you know that catastrophizing oh, yeah. oh no we're a fucked you know that kind of oh yeah, yeah. oh man I've, I've kissed a lot of those frogs <laughs> um yeah, wouldn't you say that that's a common denominator you find oh, in right. entrepreneurs? Hundred percent. I mean, even it's- in team members, someone. So I've, I, it's so, I so I can't explain it enough. I, the one example I always come back to was um, I was flying to Brazil and Obama was speaking at the same time as me, um, on the same stage as me, just like wow. he was speaking just after me. And I thought, well, Obama's here. I'm a speaker. He's a speaker. Can't I meet him? And someone that was working for me at the time went, oh no, I asked somebody and they said no. It's like, it's a fuck if they said no. Ask someone else and just keep asking. And then they were like, no, 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 Steve, we've been asking a lot. And they just said no. So I was, I'll do it then. And I I sent some emails and within 30, uh, within 30 emails, someone comes and grabs me, goes, come and meet Obama. Yeah. And I just think there's always yeah. a way. There's always a way. And your life That's and my it. life is testament to this upset, this like, there is a way or there's a way. That's, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Or it's, there's a way or I have mm-hmm. to work harder. That's you know it. what I mean? And I don't I don't allow for this other outcome, which is that, oh no, we can't. I've never so. allowed for the other outcome, ever. And it's actually my entire battery is powered by that. And I am told I radiate it. Mm. So when you're around me, you get hooked onto that. And that's can be a really good thing because it drives people in those dark days when actually the entire world is telling you no. Mm. And I'm saying yes. Mm. And so it's an amazing thing. And I think that optimism and actually now, as I said, getting older, it's actually, I I would say there's optimism. And now I also have gratitude that's powering my battery. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked out my 40th birthday. I have 29,000 days on this planet Mm. because I'm as as another golden thread that I'm sure you recognize as efficiency. I'm Mm. frigging addicted to it. So I needed to know So, you know, this life, I just need to schedule this a bit. So, (laughs) you know, so I've got 29,000 days. Oh shit, it's not 29,000 days. It's 14,000 days because I'm 40. Right, okay. And so that has also led to a countdown till I die. Mm. So that also has fueled this optimism and, and fuck it mentality. Because if today I am going to change the world, which I can... It's even fueled even in, in a in a better way, actually. I didn't have that at Not in the High Street because that was just, you know, firefighting and optimum was that 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 fuel. But now I think I have gratitude powering that even more. Mm. And that's been in a beautiful, beautiful stage of my life. That is amazing. And you're right. So you were you're in survival mode and now you're now you've got choice. Now I've got choice and a bit of, you know, the battle scars are yeah. there. And I have an appreciation that, you know, I can give everything and all, but I need to make sure that my time on the planet is also for me too. Mm. Because I do believe I'm here to serve. And I've, again, I can only say that now in hindsight, but if I am here to serve, I need to also serve myself. That sense of, uh, by the way, I completely um, resonate with the, this um, this focus on the amount of time we have left. I wrote about it in my book at very at long length. And you, I think somewhere behind me, there's a little sand timer. Somewhere on there, there's usually a sand timer. I don't know, it seems to w- w- walk around. But because <laughs> I wrote about it in my book at such length, people started buying sand timers and, and, and uploading them online. And the whole point of the sand timer is it's one of the things that really allows me to, it reminds me 
of time. It's like one of the ways we can see time happening. Mm -hmm. Just by turning it, you see your life yep. moving away. And it's that important reminder to just like get on with it and focus on what matters. Yep. You mentioned um, you now feel like you're here to serve. Mm -hmm. Do you think that comes from understanding your own power? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I would have found that really difficult to tell you 20 years ago. But now um, I have been through it and done it. And I also know that my optimism helps people and I can see the effects and I can see, you know, what we brought up in Not in the High Street was full of it. You know, I used to have people come in to the office um, from other businesses that we would hire. They literally could feel it in the air. They were uncomfortable with it. It was optimistic. It was creative. It was emotional. And they were like, this place is so emotional. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, uh, we need to stop that. And I'm like, we're never stopping that. And I think that that's what I've realized is that that is what I can muster up. You know, I, I listen to one of my favorite songs is Cloud Busting by Kate Bush. And when I listen to that song, I feel like I'm whipping up a storm. And that is my power. But what I try and whip up is very positive and good for the soul. Good for small businesses. Good for, and what are small businesses? They're founders with dreams, you know. Mm. I love that. And so um, that is why I've written, potentially that is now my job description um, mm. for the rest of my life is to build something that I can pour that in and be efficient. And so amplify it. So not build an empire, but be really smart and amplify that feeling out to other people and help them. There's an irony in that, that you're talking about whipping up a storm and your nickname's Hurricane Holly. <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> I've never even said that before. And so, yes, I, I like that link that just happened there. Slightly different meaning now. It's not yeah. less about urgency and more about, I guess, just uh, power. But Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Two different weather yeah. types. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So take me back. So you start not on the high street. It starts moving. You've got the VC money. Things, you know, the team is small. Things mm -hmm. are agile, mm -hmm. typically the most fun times. Yeah, yeah. The team was small. Um, myself, Sophie, I hired my sister, um, who was just going to help me out for a summer. Hmm. Uh, she still works for me at Holly & Co. So that's <laughs> been a good 16, 17 years that we've worked together now. Um, hired then her university friend. Her university friend came and coded the site. That, but you know, it's the, that beautiful moment that you're just literally, do you have a pulse and do you breathe? Okay, would you like to come and work for us? You know, I was talking to somebody the other day um, and he said, is that wonderful naivety where you get in a car and the cab and the taxi driver's really, really chatty. And so you almost go and offer them a job because it's just this moment where you need soldiers. You know, that's that time, isn't it? That you don't need the skill. We need power and um, we need energy and we need commitment and we need you not to have a high salary. That's the that, <laughs> that, that, that moment in time. And so that was what it was. And, you know, we were growing at 2000%. We were trying to keep up with it. I call it like that speed train with all the nuts and bolts of flying off and you're, you're at the driving seat and there you're going. And as you said, with optimism, that energy is just infectious. And so we just were growing so rapidly. So we were going from £100,000 TTV to a million the next year, to two and a half million, to six million. Now, keeping up with that, and also remember in a marketplace, you have two clients. Yeah, I always laugh at people that moan about having one client, like try to, you know, mm. you've got your customers and you've got all the small businesses, which by the way, you are only as great as their ability to keep up with 2000% growth. Some of them are growing at 5000% because they're the hot product. And so it's that coaching of that group of people to keep up with you. Meanwhile, you know, the swan to the customers and the swan to the uh, partners, which we called them partners from day one, you know, they weren't sellers, we were only as great as they, they were. And that was that beautiful shift that we were creating in this world. We were we were respecting small businesses. They would get a media pack that cost us way too much. I think about <laughs> five pounds per thing. But we wanted them to know how talented they were. We curated 
from day one, which now, you know, uh, is a word we use a lot. Back then it was not a word, you know, why aren't you accepting everybody? And we would be, no, we're turning away 90% of everyone that joins, even though they're paying a joining fee and we're eating baked beans and worrying about the mortgage. We're not getting paid a salary. We will turn away 90% because one day our brand will thank us for it. Mm. And it did. It very, very much did. You talked there about hiring mm. and that flippant hiring process at the start, which I know very well. And I, I've joked about on this podcast before, like walking into Prada and the guy selling the bags was like, do you want to be in a director? <laughs> I was like, yeah. and then like I had some guy on Facebook, he's called Ash, one of my good friends now. And he even laughs about it. He was on Job Seekers Allowance. He'd never done a job in his life. I made him marketing director. And was, I was 18 and I was just like, fuck it. You know, like, I was like, yeah, you'll but do. But you're like, what's the worst? I don't think, I think this could work out, right? <laughs> yeah. Imagine if it does work out that the taxi driver is going to be amazing. That is yeah. great. Funny enough, it, it doesn't necessarily work out that way. No, it never, no. It, almost never. No. But it's just, I think the interview process when you're that naive is literally, would you work for me? And they go, yep, yeah, fine, you've got the job. <laughs> yeah, like, or is their salary low enough yeah. that's actually double bonus? Both, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a crazy thing. The hiring process has been, again, on reflection. Something I'm learning right now to do is that would probably be one of the most beautiful points of building Holly & Co is my team and investing heavily in the development of each one of the souls that I think are lifers with me. Now, at not on the high street, it was the soldiers. You needed the energy. And then you get into the next stage, don't you, where actually those people by very nature can't stay with the business because now you need skill. And there's that awful moment where you're having to let people go for the first time and bring in skill. And to bring in skill, you now need to interview, don't you? And you now need to be able to know even what the skill is that you're even looking for as you're running at 200 miles an hour. And then it goes into that next stage where you're now looking for the people to run the people who you've just hired, you know. And that process for me was not something I could spend enough time on. I mean, we interviewed absolutely everybody until the point that we had a C-suite. And um, I always remember my father saying that 90% of my role as CEO should have been the people. 90% mm. of my role was not the people because how on earth could it be? I mean, you know, yeah. you were the next raise was happening or we were going international or, you know, we've decided to double the company in a year. And now on reflection, when I look at that, oh, it's the people. So with Holly & Co, I've now got a good group of people that I believe are lifers. And I'm happy to say that because what I believe is that they don't even know how great they are. And I'm going to shine their diamond until it completely shines. And that's dealing with their personal side, that's dealing with their professional skills, that's dealing with their whole self. Um, and that is something I'm fascinated by. And I think I'm potentially going to build one of the most incredible teams um, that, that, that I've ever been lucky enough to manage. And you've learned those people. I just, everything you said there, I'm not, I just agree with it all. I agree with every single word because went through the same, exactly the same journey of hiring anybody, bringing in skill, bringing in a bunch of people that had done this job for 20 years to tell me what to do. And I got out of the way and I let them run the team and do all the hiring for me. But then I also had the reflection three, four years in that, in fact, this whole time, what I actually was, was a recruitment company. Yeah. And that was my sole responsibility. Yeah. And, and like, then you look at all the people there and you go to the kitchen that I, I would, and I would be getting a cup of tea and I wouldn't know the person to my left. Yeah. How terrible is that? And also that you realise when you get that C-suite in, because that's what we need to do, because we've now got VCs and we need to get the, the huge company COOs and the CFOs and all the Cs, um, I call it, um, in, that they just then recruit the carbon copies of themselves. Yes. So suddenly you've got an entire organisation of mini you know, of those people. And actually, my gosh, suddenly the pendulum swings. Yeah. So for Not in the High Street, remember, we always used to say, you know, we've got our marketplace hat on one day. So that is about trading the site and understanding what customers need. And then we've got our retail hat on, which is the brand, mm. because we're not on the high street. We're not eBay. We're not Amazon. We are not on the high street. We are that beautiful mix because we know our customer. 
And so that was very interesting because actually what you need and require to be able to curate unique products and unique companies is creativity, mm. eyeballs, taste, all these things that are unable to excel. You cannot put, you know, many times I've been asked, can you just please tell me the process between A and Z of a great product? <laughs> and I'm like, you see, you even asking me that, my dear, means that you don't even understand what makes a great not on the high street product. So that was the difficulty is that suddenly you would get too much of the process in too much of the operations. Everything was a meeting. Everything was a PowerPoint, everything. And that room for creativity and life and entrepreneurial spirit started being pushed to the side. And that was a very difficult period in time. You know, we were, you know, still growing so incredibly quickly. Um, so it was a, a difficult moment to try and balance that state of growth and tech issues and operational issues and funny enough, HR issues when you have enough people um, with that need to be what I call truffle hunters now. You know, people that can really find the most unique, amazing small business that will create the next best sellers. Did you find yourself at war with the business you'd created? Um I, I loved it. So again, if I look at being a parent, I loved it, but I didn't enjoy them right now. You know, I found them difficult to live with, you know, and that's what I would say. It's you never lose your love. You never lose the, but actually what was happening was the process had become so big that the core of what I loved Founder Titus, you know, the Duracell battery. You know, that is why founders are unbelievable. Should never be moved from a business, whatever. Should maybe take a new role. That's okay. Because actually they don't enjoy the role of the operations. But that sort of Duracell battery, when you take it out of a business, you know it. I'm sure you've interviewed many people that you, something goes. The customer even knows it. Everyone knows it. And so... That was, that's just been a brilliant uh, lesson for me, but also a lesson that I now pass on through Holly & Co. You know, Holly & Co is all about me being vulnerable with the truth and ins hopefully inspiring other people that when they're growing their small business and they think they're going to hire the next person that's going to be the silver bullet, A, there is zero silver bullets <laughs> in business, but B, it doesn't work without you. You know, for all your defects and all your faults and all your weaknesses, it just doesn't work without you. And was there a moment where you realised that you'd have to take a different role within the business? Yeah, I suppose it got to that point where um, 200 people, five VCs, I was chairwoman and CEO um, and things were changing. You know, I was, you know, 15 meetings a day uh, running to the loo with my PA who would then brief me as I was in the loo on my next meeting to go into my office where it was already set up to be countlessly doing board meetings. You know, one board meeting was finished and we'd be preparing for the next board meeting. Um, and basically being at, at a stage where in any given day, did I do anything that I loved? You know, my new book is do what you love, love what you do. You know, I, I brought up this business that I loved, but every single day, did I actually ever do what I loved? And there was that moment where I needed to make that decision. Um, and it was a pretty goddamn painful one where I sort of realized I'd lost myself. You know, I was... Um, I didn't look like I look today. You know, I was in the tube dress with the high heels on, double spanks on. I was a she-man. You know, I needed to be that person. I was brought up. Remember, I was 28 when I started. I was, I was brought up through not on the high street and the experience. That's all my reference point was. And so I knew I needed to dull motion and, you know, drive this and be this person. And, um, and I think I was probably in reflection tired of not being Holly. Could you feel it? Could yeah, feel yeah, that? yeah. 
yeah, I what felt was it. that feeling? But I didn't know at the time, like you were just saying, mm. I was just in the motion. I was a hamster in the wheel. You don't know any different. You know, you just mm. exist, don't you? And mm. your whole purpose is to fuel everybody else. And sort of you, you realise that when you're not there, things go off the rails. And so you have this sense of responsibility. And every night I went to sleep, um, I would lay on my pillow. I would have my son as my responsibility. I would have my home. I was the main breadwinner of our home. But I would have the thousands of small businesses that if I go wrong ever, you know, a lot of them, 50% of them relied on that. This was their only income. Their husbands had quit their job. You know, they were doing million pounds, two million pounds a year. Like this was my responsibility and the staff were my responsibility. So I had this heaviness. So how could I be light, Holly? Hmm. How could I smile or laugh? I, you know, I, I found myself becoming a different version of me. Um, one of the lines at Holly & Co is bringing colour to grey. And I think I was turning grey. Did your partner know that, Frank? Yeah, yeah, you know, definitely knew that. We were in a catch-22 though, you know, when you bring up a business that's providing the only income, there's no way out, you know, how how, how does this go somewhere? Because my ambition, <laughs> you couldn't stop me. I was on the hamster wheel. I could see everything. You know, I always have to be reminded what year I'm in because I can see what the future is. I know what it is. So why I just need now need to make it happen. That's the the part. So, you know, we, we nearly didn't survive a few times during that um, time. You know, being an entrepreneur and having a relationship is a very, very difficult thing because, and having a young child, you know, Harry was three months old when I started NOS. If the nanny didn't arrive, he was put under my desk. You know, I remember at the age of two, he was under my desk. He had a DVD player. You remember where you actually put the DVD and you open the screen and you put the headphones on, Watsits and Ribena. And I would just sort of shuffle him in there. And there used to be a program called Mr. Brittis where she used to talk about putting the baby in the drawer when Mr. Brittis, that was what Harry was. He was under the thing because being a woman and a mother, no. You know, the kid doesn't come to work, even though I was the boss, but it was the mindset. No, we are tech female entrepreneurs. We have got to be a certain way. Um, and so that was very challenging and it puts a strain on relationships. Um, and so that has just been difficult, you know. You know, the downs are very down. Dark, dark days when you're running out of money, you've got to raise again, but the business is going amazingly you have no choice. Let's do it again. Um, and, you know, your family takes a toll. And that decision to sort of change your role, that's not a decision that's made overnight. That's a slow sort of grinding down and other conversations up until that point with the board and with other people and with Frank or... Yeah, there was. I mean, it was a bit of a storm of lots of things. I can't quite remember what was going on at that point in time but it was you know another Christmas was coming up it's going to be double what that is coming in um a very full c-suite managing that group of people um being at you know now VCs are really waking up you know what we're doing where you know I think we were at 100 over 100 million TTV you know, this was starting to become something. It was about internationalization, so doing it all again, but in other countries. And um, there was just this point that that needed to probably not be my existence in the future. So um, ripped off the plaster and did it and decided to get a seasoned CEO to come and replace me. Um, Sophie had left the business at this point a few years before. So I was... Why? Uh, her children were at a different stage of life, um, were older than Harry. So again, as a mother, it's okay when they're little. And she gave me that great advice, you know, don't worry, you've missed his first steps. He won't remember. But when they're doing their GCSEs and A-levels, they frigging need mum. And, um, and so she, you know, I realised that I was, again, I thought I could do it all. And I, I just... Now on hindsight, and my father had left as CFO two years before that. So I was sort of on my Todd. I was now this woman with this group, with these VCs. And, um, you know, you're always plagued with the imposter syndrome. And I think that I allowed that to, ha you know, determine a few things in my life. Now I look back, thank goodness for that. 
because what I'm doing today, I have never felt more powerful. I've never felt more holly. I've never felt more colorful. I've never felt more of a founder than I do today. And I'm in complete control. Um, but when we go back to the story of the two times in my life that I lost my identity, um, might I not have ripped the plaster off if I'd known what I was going to go through? <laughs> because I'm sure you've had people describe it. It is not funny losing, leaving your business. If we relate it to a child, how does a mother walk away from its kid? You know, Talk to me about that process. Yeah, it's a very, very hard one. I think actually so many more people need to talk about it because I think it's like a bit of a dark secret. Like, it's it's that thing we're all bound by certain things all this sort of um our ego is at play here you know there's so many our shame are all those points and i i wish more founders spoke about this moment because it's your entire identity goes now now i had built i was just you know hi what do you do i'm the ceo of not in the high street really da, 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 you know uh, when you wake up in the day, it's all those emails. It's all it's all that responsibility, the pressure on your shoulders. Wake up the next day, what do you do? Um, you just forget to even say you found not you know you were the founder of Not on the High Street. You're but you're nothing. So I had a couple of years that were maybe two three years, two years dark years where you know at stages I couldn't get out of bed. Um, but, you know, so when I had to do it all again, you know, I had to look at my brand heart. I had to surround myself with people who could raise the phoenix out of the ashes. Um, but it was difficult. You know, I, I couldn't go to events with small businesses. I would, you know, uh, break down. I would have to leave. I, I, I couldn't see people that I knew. I, I couldn't meet socially with people because I just didn't know who I was. Um, and it was just a very difficult time in my life. How old were you at this, this time? Well, I must have been, uh, 39, uh, no, 40, 40. And what you're describing there in terms of symptoms sounds like depression. That phase it's of- actually what I think it is sounds like is um what what I think now I think it is is grief grief mm-hmm. yeah I went through a, I went through the seven stages of grief I um it really was a loss you know that was what I was and especially as I'd always likened it to my child you know I had Harry my real baby mm. and I had not an high street now I wasn't with my second baby so how can a mother do that to start with? What happens when I'm not there? It's going to fall and I'm not going to be there to pick it up. So it was a very, very difficult process. But as I said, you know, um, I went through total grief. I I, I got counselling. Um, I surrounded myself with great people. I instantly had to start building. You know, it was the only thing I knew in my head. Um, so six months later, I... Uh, my sister uh, was employed by Norton High Street. She left, someone else left, who's now my other co-founder. And we would sit around my kitchen table. Um, I decided to ditch the heels. So I threw away every single pair of high heels I owned. Um, Today I'm wearing glitter trainers and I have done for five years. To really say that actually you can be a very powerful, knowledgeable businesswoman and wear glitter trainers. And actually this is Holly. And so slowly I started peeling the spanks off mm. the heels. I slowly started rediscovering who Holly was. I had some cheerleaders around me who would remind me on the darkest days. And I knew that creativity, like it had done with the vegetable wreaths, was there as my savior. Mm. What I had to be is Holly again. And Holly is only Holly, I think, with a business within her, (laughs) you know. uh, And when I say business and what I'm trying to rediscover with Holly & Co and trying to put it out there is actually, it's not just business. I believe creating a business makes you happy. And actually um, striving for happiness, I think that when you can control your own destiny, you can uh, work around your family, when you can be your most creative self, when you can answer to nobody, when you can dictate all of these things, where you live, what you do, 
that is a real source of uh, going for happiness. And so actually people do ask me, why are you frigging obsessed with business, Holly? Like redefining business. What is it about business? I'm like, it's not about business. Business is a tool and a key. Business is just the thing, the vehicle to get all these other things. And that is why Holly & Co sort of had to exist. I did say to my husband, never again, you know, because he couldn't, do you know what I mean? It's huge. The whole family goes through your storm, you're whipping up. But my, <laughs> yeah, they go, but. Like, yeah. oh yeah, but when you give them enough glasses of wine and you can sell anything to anybody, you can definitely tell them. So my sisters, uh, Carrie, my actual sister, Gabby, who left not in the high street and has become almost like an adopted sister, but with the founders of Holly & Co, they basically said, you can't ignore your bird's eye point of view that you had that is unique to not in the high street. You saw thousands upon thousands of businesses grow from nothing to where they are today. Because all I was obsessed with was the common denominators. The They all felt alone and yet they were going through the same thing. And I remember when we built not in the high street, naively, I thought we could have a consumer site, but I knew very quickly that they would need a B2B site because as they were growing, they would need the tools. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, well, we'll build two sites when we launch Not on High Street. Obviously, <laughs> that didn't happen. Um, now that B2B site was on the agenda at Not on High Street every year for 11 years. And uh, actually now I think that Holly & Co is my B2B scratch that I've itched. Right. But when you talk about business, normally it's done in a certain way, in a 2D way, in a grayer way. And my plight was to help the dreamers. Uh, we have a phrase, dream, dabble, do at Holly & Co. I want to help the dreamers become doers. And I want to help the dreamers go for it. And I want to help the doers never give up. And so that means you need to give business a facelift. And so that is what I'm trying to do is create a bubble, an existence for these small businesses to live in, where I sort of with the my knowledge have created a world where I answer the needs, you know, you don't need to have a business plan. You need to have a plan. You know, one day you might need to have a business plan to raise money, but you need to have a plan. And the second you take that, you pop that balloon, mm. people start coming alive. And so that is why Holly & Co was where my sisters say, you can't ignore that. And that was the moment, Holly, do you know how much knowledge you have in your head that you need to share? And there's the this of service, service part yeah. that came through. And I think as I rose from those ashes, as my wings became colourful, service was written on my back. And that has now allowed me to put myself out there as quite a private person. But because I'm of service, it doesn't matter what I feel. It's what I can do for others. And that has just been the, again, that's the fuel in my Duracell battery that just gets me up every single day. Quick one, I've recently made a purchase. I've bought myself a Tesla Cybertruck. It's not here yet, they're, they're still not to be delivered. And the reason I decided to do that, I sold my Range Rover Sport and I ordered a, a Tesla Cybertruck was because I want the vehicle that I drive to be run purely on sustainable energy. And that's also why we were so keen to have My Energy become a partner in this podcast so we can start talking about sustainable energy. And one of the great pioneering products that My Energy have created is this thing called the Zappi, which is so discreet fits on the outside of your home and allows you to charge a huge list of electric cars, including my Cybertruck. So when my Cybertruck comes, I'm going to put this on the outside of my house and this will charge it, which I think is just amazing. This is Britain's number one best-selling solar EV charger and it's beautiful. And I can't wait for my Cybertruck to come just so I can have a play with this. You refer to Holly & Co as being a good life business. Yeah. Well, I, I, I refer to it being a good life business, but I also want to uh, abolish the word SME. You know, I think that there's a whole new language that even needs to come into business. Um, and I'm not talking about businesses who want to float on the stock exchange. I'm not talking about tech businesses. I'm talking about 99.9% .9 of all um, businesses in the UK are small and medium, right? I'm talking about that when the founders sat around a kitchen table in their slippers and has come up with a great idea. Now they find themselves with 50 people. 
I want to always remind them that they were the founder with slippers with that crazy idea and that I hear them and I see them and I feel them and I want to create something for them. So the good life- Why? It sounds very personal. Because um, I really, you know, I'm of service. I care about people enormously. You know, I I feel emotional when I talk about it. Um, I want them to have the best life that they can have. And I I really live in gratitude because I'm experiencing it and I want others to. And I think I could be the key. So that is my power. And so one of the things I say to people is, you know, they're not comfortable calling themselves entrepreneurs. They don't want to be an SME. Hi, my name's Julia and I'm an SME. They don't want to, you know, so I say you you run a good life company. You balance your creativity and your need to drop off the kids and pick them up and have family life and take August off, right? With your ambition, profitability, growth, and your own little empire building. You know, those are the two things that you balance. And that's a good life. You're not looking to get Necker Island at the end. You've already, and what I always say to people is, have you ever looked at where you want to be when you're 80? You know, it's a lot of people don't, by the way. So no one, so if you want to be in your business, you know, right now, my son's working at Holly & Co's training as a barista. You know, he was three months old. He's nearly 17. He towers above me as this strong man that I thought I was going to fuck up definitely as a baby. I'm so proud of him. He has his own business. You know, that is the good life. I have brought up the next generation that needs to understand entrepreneurism. Do I, I want to exist in a world where he could be by my side in the future, where these group of this team that I've got can work with me for 20 years, where my husband, where I take Fridays off and I go on a date with my husband. That's what my good life looks like. And so that is where, you know, I can see myself at 90 here. But I do ask people, have you looked at the future? Because you, by looking at the future, understanding that last point, you can work backwards because it's normally not all the riches, the Lamborghini, the, the you know, all that thing that we, we, we see, don't we? Sunday Times rich list, you know, is that, is that really where we're heading? Or is it a world where our mental health is stable? We're with our family for as much as we can get when our health is good, um, where we're creatively fulfilled. We're changing the world, even if it's just your town, you're doing something. And, um, and that is why now people call themselves a good life business. And that requires, as you say, like a real change in narrative because Instagram and that external voice is telling you, build, hire more people, make more money. Yeah. And, and what I love about what, what you've said there as well is you, you're, you're centering. So a lot of the, when you ask a, a business um, what their objective is, a lot of them will fall into the trap of, and Simon Sinek talks about this saying, we want to be the best or number one. Mm. And just at the very end of my time at my business, I stood in front of all of my employees in the office and said, and explained why, um, why we, we had to remove that terminology from all of our, um, from all of our internal and external comms, because um, those, it, it views life and our journey as a, um, uh, a, a finite game. Like we'd get yeah. to the number one on the scoreboard, but then what then? And if, and because there's nothing then, once you're number one or you're big or you've made whatever, there's nothing then, we try and shift the company towards a direction where we viewed it as like an, a, an infinite game where um, there isn't a scoreboard and we're trying to create a sustainable life for ourselves and our company that could theoretically last for many, many, many decades. And when you start viewing your business and your employees in that way, that they might, that they could be here for 30 years, all of your decisions are different and your goals are different, but it's tough when you have VCs, of course. Of course. And impossible. so that's, for, it's impossible. Yeah. And that's what you, you then, you know, you're a chameleon, aren't you? Uh, mm. And so you, you, you will behave a certain way. So with Holly & Co, that's the liberation I have, where I understand the value of raising someone up to the highest point of their lives, personally and professionally. They are rock stars. They've never, and they 
they know that Holly and Co was the reason for that. They were set free of anything they asked and they're going to be there for 20 years and they're going to grow. So many businesses neglect history as a really, really valuable tool. You know, what you've done before and what has worked and hasn't worked is incredibly important. Um, I actually do value the, the, um, the want for people to become um, sort of the, the champions, I suppose. And so that is now the destination why I don't have the elevator pitch. I mean, who am I pitching to? You know, wh mm. why I, I don't have the destination. I have an anchor. Mm. And that anchor is my 90th birthday. I have an anchor, which is my vision, but I don't have to define it yet because I want to be around for that long. And mm. how on earth, we know as an entrepreneur, you don't, you can't tell me what's going to happen next year. Mm. You know, we, we, we can have a course, we have mm. best intentions and we can think that these people are going to be the A game. Um, and so that has been the beautiful point. And that is the knowledge I'm trying to share with this community, mm. I'm trying to help them understand that they're not a cookie cutter business. They don't need to be, they shouldn't be. Um, and that that's what I'm le hopefully leading by example. For me, a really pivotal point in what you're saying there was, either we had this guy in my business who used to ask this really annoying question when we were growing. He used to say, um, but yeah, what's like the purpose of social chain? And he always used to ask me that question, like, what's the, what's the, what's our purpose? What's our purpose? And I thought he was a bit, a bit of an irritant because we're trying to, I'm just trying to keep this thing alive. <laughs> yeah, <he's> trying, <laughs> purpose is paying you. <laughs> yeah, it's making sure I can make payday this month, then next month, then that was my purpose. Yeah. But they got to a point where I did start to reflect maybe five years in on like, what, what is this? What am I doing this for? Um, and that's when I went away that I think it was a Christmas time. And I, and I sat down, I was like, what is the, what is, what is the purpose of this company? And I came up with this www dot thing where I was like, um, work, welfare and the world, these kind of three mm. components. So the work we do and the standard of work we do for our clients and da, da, da. And I broke that down into a set of goals and values. Uh, welfare was really about the team and the family that were working here. And then the world was the wider impact that we have mm. because of our existence on the outside world. And again, that broke down into a set of goals and objectives about the environment and about philanthropy. And that gave us all this kind of www dot set of values and meaning in the world. And that's the thing that pushed me towards realizing that I had to make a company that was sustainable, one not that one, not one that was driven for the stock market. I had lost control of mm. the company mm. because there was I owned a small percent by this stage. Mm. There was board members that were triple my age. Um, I was still the CEO, but a lot of it's lip service when you don't really mm -hmm. have control, mm -hmm. right? They want, mm -hmm. they need to keep you happy mm -hmm. because you have a lot of mm -hmm. influence over a lot mm -hmm. of things. Um, but I couldn't steer the company in the direction I wanted to. And you have different objectives. There's a lot of people, 95% of the people in the board are trying to make money, mm -hmm. just more and more money by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to be this founder that's got these mm -hmm. dreams and visions yeah. of beauty yeah. and what it, and, and yeah. talking about purpose and values. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, it's just nonsense in that environment. Yeah. And, you, yeah. and it, I realized that. And so that's why I resigned last year. I realized that the way that I wanted to take the business in was not possible. Mm -hmm. I no longer had that control because as starting at 21, giving up that control, you can't get mm -hmm. it back. You can't. And now you, you have got the war scars. You've got the battle scars. Yeah. And then what's so fascinating and I'm excited for you is whatever's next, mm. you've had those hard lessons and potentially what you'll build next is going to be your good life company mm. where you can start resetting some of those things, rewiring for yourself. And we're lucky to be able to do it again. You know, that's the amazing thing. Um, but, you know, it's never, do you care still about the business? Um it's still my baby. Like it, yeah. if, I remember I saw someone, on, a competitor on LinkedIn the other day, just like they had like, um, they'd paid to take our, our name on um, SEO. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. To just like, oh, you were really looking for social chain. And I was looking at the, you fucking, like, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. and then kill. you were almost like, Who's not looking at that? Yes, that could, yes. Yeah. You I'm wanted like, to why, call someone. Yes. Why is that being yeah, allowed? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. To be fair, yesterday there was a tweet on social chain's Twitter and I was like, and I, I posted to the managing director of the US. I'm like, yeah. someone needs to step in here <laughs> and clarify. And I literally took a screenshot. I'm like, I would, if I was there, if I, I would. If I, if I was there, I'd be all over this. Yeah, yeah. I would have yeah. been. Yeah, yeah. Really, exactly. Well, you can't take you it can't. out of us, you, so you, know, you can't. Yeah. But it's, um, you know, it's, it's a, 
interesting um, world that we're living in at the moment. I think what's beautiful for Holly & Co is we are we are right in the zeitgeist of what people are feeling. So, um, you know, when we're all looking at, you know, the freelance economy, when we're all looking at the changes, remember not in the high street was built when the high street was declining. Mm. Holly & Co is here when we're all valuing mental health as something that we do talk about, um, changing the world, purpose, our environment, all these sorts of things. And so that is what I'm excited about because we are able to pivot, able to move. Um, and we're building something that is at the time that people need it. Um, we're going to have a lot of displaced people and they're going to need to be entrepreneurial and they're going to need to probably have their own businesses. And that's what I hope we can do is provide them with the the guide, I suppose. And that brings us to do what you love. Love, love what, what you, you do. do. Yeah. 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 It's an amazing experience. I'm a dyslexic. So, um, writing, you know, I remember not in the high street, Sophie had to check all my emails. That wasn't probably great because that meant that I definitely thought I couldn't. And remember she could re rewrite the English dictionary. So it was probably the wrong person, but right person at the time. <laughs> um, I didn't write until four years ago when I started my Instagram account, Holly Tucker, and I now write a post every day. But I would have to get my founders to check the post because, you know, I couldn't do it. And, you know, again, they raised me up. They said, actually, you can write. So fast forward, how on earth could I write a book? So during lockdown one, um, I created something called SME SOS actually for my community. So I went live every day on Instagram to try and demystify the news, to try and be there for them, literally just be there every, 10 o'clock every morning. And we're just going to be here for you and we can just do this together. But what they didn't know, I was also writing a book in the morning first thing. And it was one of the most beautiful experiences ever because people liked who I was and how I wrote. And um, yeah, there were loads of spelling mistakes and D's were B's and all this mm. sort of stuff. Um, but it was a wonderful experience and it allowed me in a book to almost put down everything we've spoken about today, mm. bringing colour to grey, being passionate, your energy. You don't have to be great at the PL. You have to be great at being you and we'll figure out all the rest out um, at a, another stage, um, that you are the founder, that you're the heartbeat. Brand and purpose is one of the most important things that you can put into your business. And so they're micro chapters because all the small businesses that I uh, virtually mentor don't have much time. So you can pick it up. Kids can be screaming. You can read a micro chapter. Mm -hmm. We created a exclusive product range. So every micro chapter has a almost merch that goes with it. Um, but obviously all the 50 small businesses that work with me actually do what they love and love what they do, which I just mm. love that circle. It's a colour book, which was funny because business books normally aren't colour. Mm. Um, but of course it had to be colour. And it's, um, yeah, Sunday Times bestseller and I'm super proud of it. And I hope that now writing books will be part of my life until that age that we speak about where <laughs> I'm going to wear lots of jewellery, big glasses and drink mm. lots of wine. It's such a beautiful book. Business books aren't usually like this. They're usually quite exclusive yes. in the way that they're created and the way that they look and they're never colour. So you look at it and think, oh, work. Yes. You know what I mean? Whereas well, that was the whole purpose for the creative bunch um, that are small businesses. You need to be able to love it and, it, you know, it needs to be, it needed to speak to you. Um, and so many, it's been helping so many people. It's just insane. And so, um, yeah, it's just one of those moments in my life that I can't believe I get to be this lucky. And I, I imagine, cause it was same with my, my book. Did you, did you realize it would be that rewarding? Cause the effort to create it is, oh, it's a lot. So then when you published and you got it out there and you felt the wave of inbound. Yeah, I didn't at all. I didn't even realize you know, it's like everything, isn't it? When you're doing something, you're not actually, you're so fast forward. You're like, oh, I've written that book. I really hope I get another book. Da, 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 da. You don't actually think about the moment actually the book is born, mm. you know, so you're all, you know, up to that point and then you slightly move on, you know, yeah. you, you know, and then the book's launched. You're like, oh my God, I've written a book. Look at that 
person. Oh, that was me. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. And because of COVID and timings and things like that. But the, you know, the process is not an easy one, right? When the editor comes back and goes, could you just insert that um, thought into that paragraph? And you think, really? I mean, <laughs> really? Is it really necessary? Um, and yeah, so it's just been wonderful. And, and, the, and as I said, having people, the amount it was shared, it was as if it was the community's book. And that, I never explicitly said that to the team, but that's exactly what we wanted. It needs to be the book that represented the good life businesses, mm. that someone was talking their language. And so that has been uh, really humbling. What a wonderful sort of demystifying both book, but also conversation today. It's been an absolute honour to, to meet you and to have this conversation with you. And you're right, you're one of those people that I think culture really needs right now. Someone that's been there and done it, come out the other side and said, here are all the things that are fucked up about the system and don't make the mistakes that I made or that fall into the traps that I fell into. And I think that's um, that's going to liberate a lot of people. But as you say, it's going to lead them to a much better life. So I thank you for that because I think we need more people in society that um, are willing to fight that fight. And it feels like such a selfless one, even though it must be selfish to some degree because it's given you such a huge yeah, sense of purpose, yeah. right? Yeah, well... Yeah. I, I can't believe this gets to be my life. Get to meet you. No, I'm a big fan of this podcast. Can't believe I'm on it. Um, I was just saying that I was so nervous. I've only been on a few. I'm very good at talking to others. I'm so interested in other people's, but I'm, I, I'm not very, you know, I don't do this very often. So um, it's been an absolute honour to meet mm -hmm. you. And I wish you um, your good life business in the future. Well, I'm going to let you know and you're going to have to help me. Maybe yeah. give me some advice. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much too. Thank you. 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 Thank you.